Okay, good, every, uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome again to Marseille. Uh, my name is uh, Hadi Al Khouri. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a one-year-old startup uh, based in Bordeaux, in France, and that aims at uh, automating penetration tests and audits, making them accessible to small, medium organizations. I'm also the chapter leader of ISSA, uh, France chapter. Uh, which is a non-profit organization that aims at fostering the cybersecurity community uh, worldwide. So thanks again, uh, Ina, for allowing me to uh, chair uh, this, uh, this uh, session, this talk, with uh, these two gentlemen. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, two years ago to, to give some talks on cybersecurity. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I played the devil's advocate two years ago by telling you that cybersecurity was not important. Uh, and that cybersecurity is even vital and it's getting more and more vital. And, and I hope that thanks to uh, this talk uh, and, and the feedback and the solutions that will be presented to you, you will be uh, convinced that there are solutions that are accessible and that would allow us uh, globally uh, to enhance our security posture. This being said, and, and, and just, uh, uh, just uh, an info uh, that I need to, uh, to convey, at the end of uh, this cybersecurity talk, uh, we will be airing a bonus video that could not be aired yesterday. Uh, I, I, I don't want to, uh, to disclose its content, but it will resonate a lot with uh, our talk today. So if you are not convinced by uh, our uh, arguments and the points we will put forward, I think that the video Will, will help a lot. It will encompass a bit, it will, it will overlap, sorry, uh, on the coffee break, so uh, feel free to stay uh, and feel free to, to go to the coffee break if you, uh, if you wish. So, we are in 2022, ladies and gents, in 2022, and we are not in the Middle Ages. Even if the pandemics, management worldwide made us feel here and there that we are still in, uh, in Middle Ages when we confine uh, populations like that. So I'm telling you that it's, uh, we are in 2022, uh, so do we still need to convince ourselves that digital transformation had an exponential growth with pandemic, uh, that we have more and more interdependencies and what we are experiencing today geopolitically uh, is showing us uh, how, uh, how much interdependencies are important in terms of cybersecurity and risk management the complexity. We have more and more complex uh, information systems and applications and software. Uh, there are bad guys, unfortunately, out there, okay? This is not new. Uh, so we have an urgent need to muscle up our imagination. We have an urgent need to identify and assess risks. And any organization is a target, and especially uh, your uh, organizations could be a target, and especially on the availability uh, aspect, because if I want to, uh, to, to, to really uh, uh, put a population or a country uh, at its knees, uh, I tamper, if I have the, the malicious intent, I tamper with its emergency services. So we experienced uh, in France and, and elsewhere uh, in the world some, uh, some, some bugs uh, in, uh, in emergency call centers. So could you imagine what could happen if this really is an ill-intentioned action and it could tamper uh, all of this. So this being said, uh, now the time has come for solutions and I'm uh, very uh, glad uh, to host uh, these two gentlemen. So uh, first of all, we have uh, John uh, Snap, which is the Vice President of uh, Technology at uh, Intrado safety, and I have also uh, Jeremy Capel, which is the Chief Information Security Officer at Everbridge. Uh, so uh, the floor uh, is yours, uh, and, I, and I hope that the solutions that you will put forward will, will, be, uh, will convince uh, the audience. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody, and then um, thank you for having me here today for this. So I'm going to talk about a topic that's kind of dear to my heart. It's, it's something as I look at the technology and what we've done in, in the 911 space in the United States and what's, um, what's happened in the rest of the world, it's an area that's really near and dear to my heart. It's the one area that worries me enough, that keeps me up at night um, of problems that may occur. We often hear a lot about 
denial of service attacks or IP attacks, but we're in a world of emergency communications, which is often voice-based. And one of the areas that isn't talked about as much is attacks on the telephony side, attacks on the voice side. And that's a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about today. First of all, really, who, who the heck is Entrado? I mean, we're not really well known here, but in the United States, we've been working in emergency communications for quite a while. Um, we're really a US-based company, and we're solely focused on public safety. We provide 911 services really along the entire continuum of the 911 space from working with carriers, wireless carriers, VoIP carriers, wireline carriers, and sort of non-traditional carriers through the emergency services networks, the next gen 911 networks and the legacy networks that were there, and then down to the, um, into the PSAP world with mapping and call handling solutions at the PSAP world. Um, we've been doing this for quite a while. We have about 1,400 people in our company dedicated really to just 911. Um, and we provide services across about 230 characters, carriers. Um, we really, we manage um, location and routing in the wireless world, um, and we sort of manage with that about two and a half million cell sectors in the United States that we're kind of managing um, the location aspects for those. Um, we manage 911 services for VoIP, about 200 million different um, telephone numbers that we're actually managing for that for location information and actually routing of those calls. And um, we've handled over about 400 million 911 transactions annually for what we're doing. Um, we, um, we also have delivered about 130 million or more than that next generation 911 calls in the United States. And we connect to about over six, we connect to about 6,000 PSAPs across North America. And we also did something that was sort of also near and dear to my heart a little bit. Um, we pioneered the first text to 911 service that has been deployed across the United States with all of the carriers, covering about 80% of the population in the US using location and text where you can send a text message or an MMS message and a two-way conversation with the PSAPs there. What really is a, a TDOS attack or telephony denial of service attack? It's really a form of a denial of service attack that affects the phone systems. While we often talk about the data that we see with um, websites and other data attacks, this is really hitting the core of the telephony part of it, where you're putting a service attack in so the phones can't really be answered. It a, makes an attempt for the phone system to be unavailable and really overwhelms the, the targeted system, so they can't answer the emergency calls that they're needing in these cases. Why, why would anybody do this, it's often said. It's really, um, sometimes we see financial extortion schemes, it's like we're gonna take down your system until you pay us a certain amount of money. Malicious mischief, we saw that, that was one of our early attacks that was out there, just because you could, and wanted to see what would happen with it or, or finding other reasons. Um, hackivism, it's advanced political issues. This is the one that worries me the most that we've started to see. We've been seeing attacks internationally with foreign actors attacking different systems within the United States, and that's been starting to accelerate. And I expect it would be no different here in Europe on that also. Um, another one that becomes very concerning that may happen local or internationally is redirecting of resources. By taking down one PSAP or attacking one PSAP, it can redirect their resources um, from um, a certain area to a different area on how they may um, sort of, it may not be completely overwhelming, it may, it may be false information in, to redirect the local resources so, may, so some other event could happen where areas are not being covered as well. Um, and also impacting response times. When they're overwhelmed on answering the calls, the call time to answer them may go way up. Um, and so that's what we're really seeing with this TDOS attacks. The problem, I mean, so as we've moved from legacy systems that we have in the United States to next-gen systems, the problems are there, but they've changed a little bit. The bottleneck we always have with the telephony system is typically the call takers. That's where the real bottleneck is. And when you overwhelm, when you, when you fill the call, the queues for all of the call takers, you've done a block at that point. In the past and within the U.S. and the legacy system, we had a little bit of bottleneck going into sort of the legacy network that we had limited number of trunks going in. But as we've moved to next gen, we have a giant funnel running into a small avenue, a small area. So we're now, the chances of blocking at the call takers is easier now. Um, in the past, you would have a, a single carrier might be used to come in to do a denial of service attack where somebody may be on that carrier. But the limited trunks coming in, that it would kind of block there and it couldn't propagate to a bunch of PSAPs. And we see that getting a little bit larger there. I'm going to talk a little, um, but the opportunities with NextGen make it easier because we have better ways 
to mitigate and detect than we have. So we kind of overcome that disadvantage with some advantages that we have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the attacks that we've seen in the U.S., some of the vectors that have been coming in. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about identification of mitigation methods that we've looked at. So really, what are the type of attack profiles that we may see for denial of service? Sometimes we see direct attacks. And this is really where you see a bunch of calls from one source going into one type destination that you may see and completely overwhelming the destination, where you have one actor where it may be from a series of devices they have or one, or one device they have um, or going in through one source, and they're sending lots of calls, lots of calls going in, flooding the system. They may come in looking at different calls. They may come in looking at the same. They have a bunch of different signatures that are involved with those. And then we see distributed attacks. And distributed attack was one that is a, is a bit scary, but it was probably one of the first big ones that we had within the US. And the idea is there is you may be compromising devices. In the world of mobile phones, you may be having an application or an exploit on that mobile phone that, that unknowing to the users, is now becoming a device that's attacking the network and putting up calls. Um, and this is one that is less likely, but we see, we, we're, we've seen this occur in the past, and we probably will see this occur somewhat in the future also. So what are the text factors that we've attacked back vectors that we've seen used within the United States? The first one that really came out, which was this distributed attack, was a malware attack. So in, 90, in 1990, um, or actually, I think it was 2016, or it was later than 96 on this one. So it was somewhere, I think it was 20, in 2016, um, there was um, PSAPs in 11 different, 12 different states were attacked. There was an exploit on a website um, that downloaded an application um, through a browser on a specific type of smartphone that went out there and started dialing 911. And so we saw this, this overwhelming some of the PSAPs out in the country. And it was a fully distributed. It was coming in from many different mobile numbers, across many different networks, across many different PSAPs. And some PSAPs were totally overwhelmed with, with the attack. The hardest part was people weren't really sure what was going on with this. It was really, how did they identify that? They didn't know what was going on. It was overwhelming their centers. There were these silent calls that were coming in. And nobody really knew what it was. Um, the, the attack lasted for three days, and in the end, it was really an 18-year-old that had done this because he was hoping to exploit a bug in, um, in an operating system on a handset and maybe get some reward for, for finding this bug on the phone. And he'd put it out there, not totally realizing what was happening, but it really impacted the network. Of course, that bug was fixed, and now we have, and, and so it's been solved at that, at that point. If we look within here when I show the network, we're going to talk a little bit about the U.S. 911 network. Um, what we kind of have here on the screen is we, the U.S. network is a complex and distributed network. We have the next generation systems, we have legacy systems, but in general, the 911 network in the U.S. is a fairly dedicated network. It's hard to ingress into the network. Um, inside the PSAPs, they typically all also have publicly accessible phones that at many times ring down to the same call takers. So depending on how it's set up in the PSAP and how they're looking at it, it still may be overwhelmed just by attacks coming in on their publicly published phone numbers that are typically used for non-emergency but often ring to the same stations but maybe in different queues. The dedicated network is much harder to get into, but I'll talk about some exploits even there that have been utilized on how they can get into it. And that will be very parallels to what could happen into the European systems too on both the dedicated and the publicly addressable type side of it. One thing that we've often looked at in the US for security for telephony system is, my, my, is security through obscurity, probably one of the worst ways of doing security. The idea is like, people aren't gonna attack it, we're gonna obscure it, we're not gonna publish these numbers, we're not gonna have these numbers, we're, they're not gonna know where all the ingress points are, so we're, we're gonna be fine with that. Just, just by obscure, obscuring it, they're not gonna really know how to get in. Hackers have been really good on figuring ways to get in, and you'll see some of these um, on some of these exploits that have been done, how they've been able to find their way in um, through sort of different mechanisms. The next vector that we saw coming into it um, was coming in, this is really sort of a, um, the, the 
a single point attack coming in is, and we saw this in areas of Florida and other parts of the country, but particularly this was one that happened down in Florida where a, ha where a foreign national hacked into a system, hacked into a PBX, a, public, um, a, a private phone system inside of a hospital. So they hacked in through a traditional sort of IP attack into the hospital. It didn't have a lot of um, defensive mechanisms onto their PBX. It was exposed pretty well. They got in and they started making a lot of phone calls, 911 phone calls. And so in this case, the, um, the PBX for the hospital was going into one specific PSAP, but they made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls into that PSAP. The PSAP was seeing it, the calls keep coming from the hospital, but they didn't know what to do at that point. They knew it was from, they knew it was from a specific um, hospital, but they didn't know what carrier it was coming through, what trunk it was coming into their system. They just knew they were getting overwhelmed of calls. This one was a little, little easier for them to identify because it was coming from the same destination number that came up as the same name. But still, it took them, it took hours and hours and hours for them to identify it and finally be able to find a mechanism to block it and to be able to block those calls coming in. Um, and it took a while to do it. They didn't have mechanisms set up to deal with this in advance. And so this is an easy possibility. So we thought, well, the 911 network is secure because it's a closed network, so you have to be a trusted device onto it. Well, the hospital was a trusted device on the network, but users hacked into it and utilized that trusted device to do overwhelming calls into that PSAP. Another vector that we see, as I go too far, um, Another vector that we often seen is a VoIP attack. Um, within the US, people will be able to get a VoIP number, but they can utilize these calls. So it's again into the private network of the 911 network. They have a registered phone, they've, um, they've got it through legitimate means, um, they're connected into the network, they, they're, they're using it, but people may get these numbers and use them for other purposes. Can't really control where the people are that have the numbers. We've had some control in assigning the numbers, but we can't necessarily control how we use them. So we've seen this where they, where they get these numbers and they set them up, and they may be setting up multiple numbers. And unfortunately, in the United States, how we deal with VoIP is the location, the user, by, by mandates from the federal government, um, the user has to put in where they say the address of their device is. So they can put in anywhere it's a valid address and they put it in. There's no method on that system to know exactly where that device is. They may have had to register it and it's a valid address and, and all of this, but we can't tell if they've moved it or they've taken it to a different spot. So what some of the hackers have done on this or t using these devices is they're making a bunch of calls into a location. They're dialing into 911 and can flood it because in the past when we had a wireline phone, you could only make one call to get it through. But with a VoIP phone, very much like the PBX, they can dial multiple calls simultaneously on these VoIP lines. And so they can, sing, they can overwhelm a single PSAP with one VoIP device. They take a couple of VoIP devices, it, it does more. Um, when they define the address of where this device is, it defines which PSAP it goes into. And we've seen attacks where they'll go in, attack one, change the address, attack a different PSAP, change the address, attack a different PSAP. And we've seen simultaneous attacks occur at the same time, where we do this in multiple states around the country, where the attacks where we believe is from these same devices coming in, um, and they're attacking. They can use the same device in this mobile number because the PSAPs may not have the knowledge of what an attack was at a neighboring PSAP, They'll use that same device and change the address slightly with the same phone number and attack a neighboring PSAP. And so we're starting to see these and it becomes very easy to overwhelm, overwhelm the PSAPs because they got really big pipes going into the VoIP carrier, really big pipes going into the network and starts overwhelming maybe the, the eight or 10 or even 30 station PSAPs that are receiving the calls. And these again are going across the dedicated network that we may have. Um, the other one that's a little bit scary is we have a dedicated 911 network, but in both the, um, the legacy systems that are out there, and we've even seen in some of the next gen, they put some unpublished numbers on that are connected into the dedicated network that are on the public switch telephone network. They're not published, but they're numbers that they utilize for doing testing. 
what we saw in one state in the U.S. that hackers found these numbers. We've got robocallers and word dialers out there that were dialing through, and they found these numbers that were for these test trunks. And they completely shut down the PSAP within, one, within an entire state off of these dedicated switches by using these test numbers to come into the network and be able to really shut down the network. Um, since then, these numbers have been closed up, but it's something to really think about is what are the ingress points for your calls coming into the centers and how, how might those be protected? <clears throat> um, another one we have, so we have the dedicated network. The one that really happened first was coming into these admin lines. They would do sort of robo-dialing, word dialing. These numbers are published. They're in, the, um, they're in the directories within the U.S. to say if you need to contact the police or medical in these specific cities, here's your non-emergency number. Works great. There are different trunks coming in. You can't overwhelm the 911 network, but you can overwhelm the call takers. The call takers are the same ones receiving these calls. Um, they can start saying, I'm going to not answer the administrative calls, and I'm going to answer just the 911 calls, but they have to identify that and realize what's happening and put a policies and procedures in place to be able to do that. Many times it's catching them off guard. They don't have prepared as plans to think about this and prepare for this and what they're going to do in the situations. Um, so it ends up being a denial of service attack against the entire PSAP just on the admin lines. And we saw this happen in, in quite a few of the PSAPs around the country that it's occurred over and over again. And sometimes on the admin lines and sometimes on like the text on the lines coming in on voice calls coming in, they're utilizing this direct, direct resources by something in the U.S. we call swatting. They'll call in to say, um, we're, we're having a, um, we have a, a kidnapping or we have somebody's holding me at gun at this location or there's a person in this location with a gun or a knife and they, it's not really happening but they're redirecting resources saying it's happening at this VoIP location or this number. We call it swatting because it's sort of the, the, they'll send the SWAT teams out to deal with this. It becomes a very, very difficult redirection of resources and a very dangerous situation for the responding officers and the place they respond, the innocent people that they're responding to where is, there's claim there's an event coming on. So this is coming through, it's another sort of way of a, not truly a denial, a telephony denial of service, but a redirection of resources using the same mechanism. So what do we really do to combat it? How do, we, how do we deal with this sort of telephony denial of service and how can we protect ourselves? The biggest part is we've got to be able to have policies, procedures, and systems in place to detect it. You've got to be able to detect that you're actually having an attack. So the idea of the hospital one, you've got maybe you have 15 call takers in this, in this PSAP. You're getting all these calls from the same number, but they may not, it may take a while for them to realize until the same number gets back to the same call taker that they're actually getting a denial of service. But pattern detection, um, looking at the calls coming in, systems can easily flag these and tell you that you're starting to have a denial of service attack. And so first step is really in just detecting that you're having it. You're looking at duplicate number detection, um, route detection. Are you getting a lot of calls coming in on a specific route from a specific carrier? Um, you would notalize, know this possibly from the, the ESI net is coming in for next generation. Where are these calls coming from? Are they all coming from one wireless carrier? Are they all coming from one VoIP carrier? All the ingress points in this network, where are they coming from that we can, we can look at what those are? And then we look at mitigation. This really matters of difference of is it on the 911 dedicated network or is it on the admin lines? Can we put solutions on the edge and the, and the, um, and the border gateways, the SBC sitting on the edge for the SIP world or other devices that are sitting there to be able to do it? We need to have some type of valves, a way of a spigot or a valve to be able to turn, um, redirect traffic that may be coming in. In the world of public safety, we don't necessarily want to block traffic. There's the, there's the challenge of we're going to have valid calls coming in with potentially invalid calls. We don't want to have the person that has a heart attack that's calling in um, block his calls because he's coming from the same carrier where we're having an attack, um, a denial of service possibly from a hospital, um, PBX that was hacked. So we want to make sure that we can have spigots to redirect it or do it in different ways. Um, and one of those ways is really making sure it's really a person and not a bot. One of the things that we often see that we utilize as a redirection is instead of this traffic coming in, maybe from a specific carrier we've identified, 
we'll send all of that traffic to an IVR, an inter interactive voice response unit, that will make sure they're a human. It may go through and say, um, to reach emergency services, please press, press three. The next time it's Android, it may say, please, please press two, and so on. It kind of goes through that a bot can't necessarily get through automatically um, to be able to do it, or more sophisticated kind of a CAPTCHA check to make sure it's really a human on the end of the line and not a bot, because most of the attacks are coming through with some type of a computer bot. Um, we look at duplicate number detection that may be out there to say, hey, I'm getting a bunch of calls from these numbers. I'm not going to redirect the entire carrier. I'm going to redirect these specific numbers out to my mitigation type mechanism to start doing the spigot. Route detection. Maybe we know that we're having a, a VoIP attack that's from multiple numbers, and they keep changing the numbers. They have a lot of them, but we know it's all coming from one specific carrier. So we could simply send that carrier so it's not impacting the others to this whatever, the, whatever this sort of the jail or validation point is that can start screening out some of those calls. And we also look at path shutdown, which is really the worst one. If you're having a really hard attack coming in and it's really distributed, you may need to take that entire path and shut it down if you don't have some other mechanisms to be able to detect what the type of call is. So that's kind of the ideas of how we look at the important part is, in sort of summary, is being able to detect what the problem is is the key number one, and then being able to mitigate where it is. The nice part is on the mitigation inside of the ESI nets, you can direct it before you get to these narrow, the narrow bottlenecks of the PSAP. You can redirect it to the mitigation devices within the network. You can screen it by a phone number, a route, or other areas that give the PSAP possibly the control to redirect those. The PSAPs often need to have mechanisms within the PSAP for detection, and they may have edge devices that help protect them on their admin lines or other. There's quite a few companies out there that have TDOS-type um, applications for being able to, um, to utilize to, um, to, to help mitigate this. There's a lot of them that are working in the US with um, different Department of Homeland Security has been looking, working with different companies on that. Um, there's a lot of companies in the telephony world that are, that are kind of do, they're doing that. But I want to thank you very much today, and um, if you may have any questions. Thanks a lot, John, for this uh, insightful and very visual uh, presentation, especially when it comes to attack vectors. So it's the ever-ending cat and mouse, you know, game. So, and, and this reminds me of, I was talking about um, Middle Ages. Those are derivatives from freaking and war dialing techniques, which were prior to hacking techniques back in the 80s. So we are still so somehow and some, sometimes at the same place. Uh, can we take uh, some questions, if you would like? Uh, from the audience, any any questions, comments? How many of you have identified one or several of those attack vectors that John just displayed? So no need to comment, <laughs> need to work. <laughs> Okay, so if there are no questions or comments, I uh, leave the floor to Jeremy. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'm going to start off just with a bit of an introduction, explaining who I am and why I'm here today. So my name is Jeremy Capel. I started back in security back in Johannesburg, South Africa, during the post-apartheid era which really saw uh, a whole bunch of novel new cyber attacks and physical attacks, whether they were bombings, protests, and we had this emergence of attacks from Africa stemming down to South Africa. It was before Bitcoin, so intercontinental fund transfers was quite difficult, and it was far easier to go and attack the south of or the hub of Africa for that. So. Um, I started off building Deloitte's first resiliency practice, which included cyber, corporate, and physical security. As you can imagine, that must have been uh, quite a challenge given what was going on in Africa, but we did learn a lot through that process and it really propelled us forward. Following that, um, I joined NTT's subsidiary in MIA, uh, which is, goes by the name Dimension Data, and drove their security program. 
and then moved to the United States to go and build the world's first fully virtualized 5G network and all the security controls to virtualize and enable that network to do automatic slicing across the states. Um, now I'm with Everbridge and I'm extremely proud to be back in resilience and part of an organization that has a proven track record and is dedicated to a mission of saving lives. And more recently, they have put together a task force of really incredible people to go and provide free services to enable solutions for all humanitarian aid to the Ukraine in support of the Ukraine crisis. And I think that team deserves a round of applause. Can I please get a round of applause for them? It is a really great mission, and today what we're going to be talking about is the digital decade and how this is actually transforming. Now, most of us will remember the dot-com era, uh, back in the day when everything was just the first time we could buy something online, and every organization was popping up with this e-commerce, and we, we got pretty familiar and comfortable with e-commerce. Where the shift is going now is there is the digitization of society. We've got this new generation moving in. A generation where children have gone to school remotely now because of COVID. They're having friends scattered all across the globe that they consider really good relationships that they've never even met a day. So this is a generation that is shifting. They're used to being online, and that's changing the way we do things. So we take a look in the top left there. I just want to focus on a few of these things. Uh, if we look at the fact that we're moving towards e-government, the ability to access and control all government agency aspects online, do things like voting and have the ability to actually execute governance and run economies online. Uh, it's pretty fascinating today. If any one of you own a Tesla, you go do a service, you jump online on the internet and you do your car service through the internet. We're dynamically shifting, banking, Every single thing about society, including, we, we, we laugh at it because it's called social media, but it's changing and it's actually becoming society. Now, IT security used to be about protecting the system that you have in a business. It's now shifted to protecting the actual individuals, the communities in which we live and communicate and uh, thrive in, as well as nation states themselves. And that's also shifting if we shift over to the right over there into data. We were very worried at one stage about personal identifiable data or anything that can basically point at you and say that is you. Um, we're now moving in this industry and what's becoming more important is behavioral analytics. Imagine I know because you use a Garmin watch, the route you run every single morning when you go for a jog, if you go for a jog, um, or where you go and eat breakfast and lunch, or where do you drop your children off at school? This is all information that is now shifting how we think about security. It's about understanding how societies work and then taking advantage and disrupting those societies. An interesting one there is e-identity. I'm not sure many of you know, but if you've got an apple in your, your um, pocket, it's pretty soon that we're going to be allowed to have ID cards and passports in your digital wallet and considered authentic and identifiable as an individual. This is technology that's busy being evolving, but it's being accepted into policy. And all of these are changing the way that policy is working within these governments. The last layer over there is really on the digital infrastructure side, and we're going to dig into this a little bit more because as a nation state, you've got critical infrastructure that used to all be isolated within your country. So you could protect it, you knew it was there, and if you protected your country's borders, well, guess what? You would assume that your electricity, you would assume that your pipelines, and you would assume that your uh, internet connectivity is all protected, even your telecommunications. Now that that's all becoming digitized, uh, that's accessible, and the ability to disrupt that is accessible from anywhere on the globe. I'm going to dig into there a little bit more, but before we shift, I want to point out, if we look at the bottom right of that, I think it's the bottom right, yeah, uh, attackers are really trying to go across all these spectrums now. You have to think about stopping the way that society is working. You have to think about what can actually be done with the data that is accessible out there. And a good example of this is today, phishing campaigns, and for those that don't know what a phishing campaign is, it's an email that's mass distributed to everyone 
to try and convince them to click a button or put in a password or something like that and extort information or convince you to pay money. But what's happening today is there is artificial intelligence and machine learning that goes and scrapes all your social media and instantaneously formulates unique messages that are tailored directly to you so they feel extremely personalized. And people are falling for those. Now, it would take a traditional person uh, roughly a week to go and investigate an individual and craft custom emails. Now, within minutes, we can do that across hundreds of thousands of individuals or to a targeted phishing campaign on an organization, city, country. It's extremely efficient. Uh, and that last layer there is really the disruption. So I'm going to move into the detail over there in a second. So I want to focus on three critical pillars today. The first one over here is critical infrastructure. This is where we, we really need to start thinking about the concept of uh, IoT. And in the past, there were these machines called SCADA machines, and basically all these industrial controls that would operate your pipelines and operate your electricity units and your grids. And now all of those have shifted where that engineer wants to be able to sit on his phone just like you when you're at home and access his systems. The problem is those are normally built on old infrastructure and are the biggest target for attacks, whether they're terrorist attacks or disruption attacks, even competitive attacks. Um, this has gone so far as in the medical fields. Think about this distribution of vaccines that took place. If you go and change the temperature by five degrees in a facility, it all becomes null and void. You cannot utilize any of that uh, product that is being produced and distributed. So these are the types of things we've started to see. And we've also seen a real emergence of the use of that technology. So let's take in Africa as an example. We've started to deploy remote medical equipment in rural areas that are really difficult to get to. And any disruption during a procedure you could imagine is dire consequences. So we would get in that viewpoint. Uh, as I mentioned earlier is I was brought into the States to come and drive the security around fully virtualized 5G capabilities. And what this basically means is you've got a, a radio on the side of the street that we're all used to seeing and we really don't like. And after that, you get this thing called the radio access network, which distributes the signal. And then you get the core, which is the ability to do things like SMS or make the call and the functions that operate that. Every single thing after that radio on the side is being virtualized and put into the cloud. So this means it's sitting in Amazon or Google, GCP somewhere, and people again can access that from anywhere. Now, even on the radio side, that's shifting. There used to be these physical towers sitting there on the side of the road. Now you can go buy a helium uh, miner, which you insert at your home, and the, the, telecom, the telecom companies can bounce their signal off that and actually communicate and take your cell phone through individuals' houses. The last one there is essential services, which I think was brought up earlier, and I thought it was a really good point. What we're seeing in a lot of attacks is a real focus on uh, either trying to intercept it and prevent communications going, but also trying to take over solutions because they're not secure enough and actually start distributing false communications. Think about uh, directing everyone to a, a point where there is actually a bomb, as an example. Uh, being able to send that misinformation, cause panic and, and communities to become more distraught in those situations and disasters. So there really is a focus there, and what becomes fundamental is making sure that we can secure those transactions in that environment. So, if we shift over here, what is the future actually holding? We're seeing a convergence of physical and digital. No longer can you sit in an ivory tower doing IT security, and then sitting in another one called physical security, and pointed fingers at each other when things go wrong. If we take a look at attacks these days, they're integrated, they're planned, and they're hybrid attacks. Now, this could be as simple as I use digital RFI copying or cloning to be able to gain physical access into a building, or I come in as a guest or an unannounced individual and I drop USBs there to, become, to gain digital access to your environment, as an example. More recently, we've seen in the Ukraine crisis uh, a true hybrid attack in which there were three digital attacks being done on the front while physical and uh, air attacks were taking place. We saw DDoS attacks 
being targeted at all critical infrastructure, there was a uh, vulnerability that was able to be turned into a bit of a wiper virus, similar to a ransomware, except it just deletes everything instead of encrypting it. But there was a, it's called the hermetic wiper that was found months before, but held back for a time of crisis, then released when the attack took place. We also saw a increased spread of misinformation through bots with social media. That uh, we've also seen personally in the US elections. Uh, it seems to be a big target of spreading misinformation. Now, if you're having these hybrid attacks and you're trying to respond to those hybrid attacks in silos, that's where the point of chaos comes in. It's not coordinated. You're unable to uh, respond in the same way that they're planning to do. And I always find it funny because one thing about security professionals is we all like to keep all of our secrets close and not share information. But the enemy, let's say a hacker, goes and finds a vulnerability, it becomes public, and you have thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people around the globe working on how to advance that, how to take opportunity out of that, how to keep it turning and evolving into something more and more severe. And we need to start sharing, we need to start collaborating a lot closer in those spectrums. Now, how do we actually prepare and respond to that? Uh, I, let me give you an analogy. Imagine for a second, you're a father, you've got your daughter and your wife, and you're in a country or a conflict zone, no matter where it is, something's going wrong. And you're getting a whole bunch of misinformation from social media spreading around, trying to understand. You've got friends, family, getting their own insight from their friends and family and chains, and you're trying to make decisions about where to go, what to do. And you get a message from your company or your state saying, hey, please go do this. How are you going to trust that? How are you going to have the trust to go follow it? Now, you have to have exercised and made sure that your organizations and the employees that you work with are very familiar with your processes and know your capabilities. On the other hand, imagine you're coordinating this. And I speak from personal experience where I've had to manage two extractions in the last six months. Um, you're sitting on the other end, and you are coordinating telling somebody to take their daughter, to take their wife, and go to a location where you can be extracted from. How are you going to do that if you're not confident in the solutions that you're using? You clearly need to have very, very good intelligence. You clearly need to have uh, situational awareness, which means the ability to know as things are changing on the ground. You also need access to those solutions globally distributed so no one can disrupt them. And when that communication comes in from one person to the other, it needs to be secured and made sure that uh, you have the right security controls that nobody can interfere, intercept, and put false information in there at the same time. And not only is that not enough, you need the ability to know that you've got the capability to deploy assets on the ground. What is the point of communicating out and having the ability to talk to people if you can't get an Airbus into the country and evacuate resources out? And this is why it's so important to become resilient. And becoming resilient means you have an ecosystem that you can actually trust. If I'm going to be coordinating an extraction, I surely want to know that I have the ability to coordinate, get responses, get intel that's up to date, and at the same time have assets on the ground that can go and extract and do what needs to take place. And the only way I'm going to be able to give that message is with that confidence and that trust. So I do want to re-emphasize it is no longer good enough to have an application that sends messages. You need a capability that provides resilience through an ecosystem. Now, if we go and have a look at what's happening in the EU, I'm gonna bring out some examples here, but this is actually a global situation that's taking place. But EU has produced a strategy that they're working on to combat cybersecurity and bring this all together. And these look very familiar to what I've just discussed. Uh, I like the lack of EU, uh, situational awareness. Again, this is because we're not sharing, we're not collaborating, we're not between public and private sharing that information while the attackers are on the other side sharing as much as possible. Joint cyber units across the EU is something that we need to get to, to be able to respond in unity. That was one of the things why uh, Everbridge got involved with the humanitarian aid into Ukraine is because there just was no coordination giving them the ability 
to centrally coordinate, providing those services for free. It makes a fundamental difference to people on the ground when you're trying to actually deliver aid out there. The EU's critical infrastructure, again, and this is global, this is not particular to, the, to Europe, but this is global. Critical infrastructure is built on old DDoS systems. Uh, not DDoS, sorry, DOS systems. You, you'll remember the type of computers we got when we were growing up. They're built on those capabilities, and they've never been upgraded because you never needed to. You weren't connected. Nobody could get access to them. But now that we've shifted over, we just haven't caught up in that space, and we're far behind, and it's one of the first entry points we need to be monitoring and taking care of. I'm going to go over quickly to the recommendations, and just to reiterate most of what we've been talking about. The first one is trusted intelligence. We need to make sure that if we're making those decisions from a cyber realm, um, me as a CISO, making sure that my solutions that we're providing to the clients, we're providing to people that are coordinating responses, have the right intelligence in them. So the sources have to be correct. We also need a trusted crisis and command solutions. Again, having an instance of a solution somewhere, but then that gets disrupted and is not accessible in a crisis is just not acceptable. These solutions have to be resilient. They have to be globally distributed and accessible. Uh, a lot of thought needs to go into how do we make sure they have the right disaster recovery capabilities so that we will always have them available when we need them. It doesn't help if they're 99% up, but when you need them, they're not available. This integrated ecosystem is extremely important because if we're getting, we're managing mass communications, whether that's in a, let's say, a policing solution, or if we are in an actual, let's say, humanitarian crisis, or even if we're just dealing with mass fires or flooding, and we're going to be distributing communications, and we're going to be tracking and wanting responses back, we need the ability to see if an individual is okay to select yes or no to be able to respond. We want to make sure we do reach them and we've got the right coverage sets. Um, and that ecosystem is important because things change all the time. We've, been, we've helped through processes of protests. And if you can think, sometimes the protest will change its uh, route that it's taking. And you need to be able to have that awareness to shift the strategy and move it. So that's situational awareness and ecosystem. The other thing about the ecosystem that's critical, which should be the next one, is testing it. Again, remember being that father sitting there. If you don't know and you don't trust your own solutions that your organization is pushing forward or your local government is pushing forward um, and giving you that advice, if you haven't seen them in the use before, how are you going to know that that is actually them when the crisis hits? How are you going to trust that? So exercising and doing awareness around this is fundamental. Lastly, actually, yeah. Understand the risk. So understanding the risk for me is, is also fundamental. It's what, what I've seen over and over in these circumstances is people go into the, uh, let's say, the programs that they, they take, the roles that they take, and they get some type of audit or compliance requirement to say, hey, I need mass communication. So what do they do? They go out, get an RFP, get some type of product that's out there that can do some form of mass communication. But then when you're actually in the situation where you actually need to be able to respond, A, you can't access them. Or they cannot send sufficient messages out at the time when you actually need them because there's capacity limitations. Or you're sending messages, but you just don't have that ecosystem and physical capability to be able to respond to them. Um, that should be it from me today. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Do we have any questions, ladies and gents? Yes, we have one here, please. Thank you. And thank you for the, the presentation. So Vincent Jeffrey here. Uh, Jeremy, you made a very, very important point about uh, building resilience and the, the, the need for uh, collective information and sharing, right? For the longest time, that's been a very, very big problem. Why? Because 
Um, we all want to contribute, we all want to share information. Now, if I am working for a, let's say, a, a uh, major bank, we are being attacked, how do I share this information? Because we don't want to make the headlines, right? So um, sharing information uh, in the context of cybersecurity has always been a very challenging. So just curious, uh, your experience, your, your recommendation on how to get together those groups of people that are uh, cybersecurity experts, and, and, and how can we ensure that we can all trust each other so that when something bad happens, then we can collaborate and without the fear of, you know, disinformation being used against us. Perfect. That, that's a really good point. I'm going to answer it in two ways. So the first one is when you think about not sharing stuff, it's because traditionally you've been bound to think about keeping things isolated and secured. As generations are coming up, sharing is becoming way more common. So you think about children in terms of social media, content that they share, whether they're embarrassed about something or not, they don't care, they're sharing it. It is a generational movement that is changing. Uh, so, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. This doesn't only take place in uh, between, let's say, banks, but let's talk about policing systems. I'm pretty sure every single one of you know that your policing systems in your countries do not share stuff amongst themselves because they feel like it is their IP. Um, you, you've got people, and even in the States, we've had situations where we have people in one county that has an arrest warrant that they're arrested in another county, there's no association to them. Sharing amongst those uh, and different types of forces. We've got a lot of three-letter agencies in the States, and they, they have not traditionally been good, but that is evolving over time. Um, to your point, one of the major ones is ISAC, so the ability to have industry-specific sharing that's going on. But I do believe in pushing that a lot further. I think you need to be having industry mixed with uh, federal. We need to make sure that from a government agency, because in most cases, this is going to sound strange, but in the cyberspace, the government agencies are often far behind with the except of an elite team that sits somewhere in a national team or something. So sharing between the public sector is becoming more and more fundamental. So to answer your question, somebody has to pick up those initiatives to go drive them. I do believe that what the EU is doing at the moment with their strategy, please take the time to go read it if you're interested, is going to start to enforce some of those um, conversations taking place. Uh, and, and it's less about uh, disclosure. One of the things you're worried about is if, if I say I was under attack, then I, I, I show that I'm a victim. No, you've got to show that you're under attack so together you can find ways to solve them because I guarantee you the other banks are already under attack. They just don't know yet or they haven't found out yet. That's the reality. Thank you for the question. Do we have another question or comment? So uh, again, you can stay if, you, if you'd like, um, uh, and you can leave for the coffee break. Uh, my concluding remark is the following. So we are, we are noticing that we need this uh, security culture shift. We need to build capacity, and, and we need to share information in a smart way, because we have one single enemy. So we need to outsmart the threat. Yet, when I asked you uh, earlier how many of you have identified attack vectors, we had like uh, a couple of people just raising their hands. So there's an obstacle, yet another obstacle somewhere. And maybe this obstacle is somewhere in our brain, and hopefully the upcoming video will give us some insights on, on why we are not able to accompany that change and why we are not able to muscle up our imagination and to do uh, the required prevention. Thanks a lot, and let's air the video. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and sorry for not being able to be with you. I have COVID. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about public perception of crisis communications. My name is Albert Mukaber. I'm, uh, I have a PhD in neuroscience and I'm a clinical psychologist. And I work on how we form our opinion and how we react to things. So I'm going to try to synthesize a bit uh, these topics uh, in the 20 minutes that I have uh, allotted. Um, before we talk about public perception and crisis communication, we need to start uh, with the basics of our cognition. And we'll use a question to, to think a bit about the topic. And this question is the following one. 
why don't we all react the same when faced with a crisis? Why don't we all think alike? Why don't we all uh, have the same opinions? We are supposed to have a common reality that is supposed to be stable and shared by everyone. For example, now you're going to listen to me talking for about 20 minutes. And if you, someone asks you, what did you think about this presentation? You might not have the same opinions, which is very weird. You're going to hear the same voice, the same words, you're going to see the same slides, etc. but you're not going to think the same thing. And obviously there are many reasons for this. We don't have the same culture. We didn't grow up in the same eras. We don't have the same biology. We don't have the same genes. But in cognitive science, we think that even if we did have a similar environment and similar biology, we would not think the same anyways, because of three main reasons that are very important when we're talking about communication. And these three reasons are the following. The first one is that our perception is partial. We have limited cognitive resources that make it that we cannot perceive everything that's going around us. And our attention is limited. We don't remember everything. Even if you hear the same uh, presentation and you're spending, you're listening to great talks throughout the day. At the end of the day, you don't remember everything you've heard and different people will do, remember different things. And these two uh, limitation of our cognition are made worse by the fact that the world is complex. If the whole planet was uh, the room I'm currently uh, in, after a while, we'd probably have the same opinions. So these three ideas that we have a partial perception that our attention is limited and that the world is complex makes us lead us to a certain rule of cognition that we're all constantly surfing uncertainty, that we're all taking decisions and evaluating communication with incomplete information. We don't have a full grasp on everything that is at play. And depending on how much information exists, we're going to create our knowledge. And these three points get us to the topic on which I work in my everyday, everyday life. And it's, the, it's that if we have incomplete information, if we don't have a full knowledge of things, then how can we acquire knowledge? How can we make sure that the information that we're acting upon is of good quality? And this is even more important when in crisis, because in crisis, uh, if we're basing our decision on bad knowledge, we could lead to disastrous information. And for the longest of time, we didn't really have means to acquire knowledge. We would use what we call intuitive knowledge acquisition. And there are many examples that can be fun or less fun uh, on this topic. For example, there's a researcher called Tyler Vigen. Uh, and Tyler downloads uh, public databases, so all the numbers you see are true, and puts together things that are a bit unrelated. For example, on this graph, in black, uh, you have the films in which Nicolas Cage appear in, Nicolas Cage, an American actor that you probably all know. And in red, you have the number of people that have drowned by falling into a pool. Obviously, there are absolutely no relationship between these two factors, but you can get a correlation of 66%. And you can tell yourself, maybe if you want to fight uh, uh, drownings, we should ask Nicolas Cage to uh, do less movies. All of this is absurd. This is even worse. The correlation here is 99.79% between how much the US spends on science, space, and technology, and the number of suicide by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. Again, these graphs illustrate a very known uh, concept in research. Correlation is not causation. It's not because two things follow each other that uh, um, 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 that they're causing each other. And sometimes these examples are uh, are fun. Uh, COVID cases evolve with the number of McDonald's in a, in, a, in a country, but sometimes they lead to actual decision in public policy. For example, in the 50s, there was a small pen, mini pandemic of polio cases. And back then, the polio cases were correlating in a very peculiar way with ice cream sales. And until we figured out what was happening, the communication back then was to avoid uh, ice cream sales. The doctors did the recommendation to avoid ice cream, to avoid e eating ice cream. And then we paid a bit of money to, to recall all the ice cream stocks, thinking that the ice cream was being contaminated by uh, polio. But when they tested the ice creams in the lab, the ice creams were totally fine. There was nothing wrong with the ice cream. And this was due to something we call a confounding variable. The real reason why, in this case, it's not a, 
uh, hazardous, uh, spurious correlation, like Tyler calls them, uh, Tyler Vigen on his website, the ones we've seen before. In this case, there is a reason. We call this a confounding variable. And in this case, it's the weather. When it's hotter, we eat more ice cream. When it's hotter, polio spreads faster. And our brain, be with in incomplete information, because we don't have access to all the information that's available because of the limitation of our cognition, this is our brain is going to kind of invent uh, an, an invisible link between ice cream and polio, and then the communication we're doing is going to uh, be impacted uh, by this. However, we how, how would we do? Because we don't know uh, all the information that exists. And from this little introduction that I've just done, we get to a certain principle uh, in, in cognition, that is, the map is not the territory. Uh, the map being the representation of the world and the territory being the real world. And we don't have access to the real world. We're just creating maps. For example, in science, our maps are called theoretical models. We try to create models that try to be as close as possible to reality. And in some fields, our maps are actually quite robust. For example, uh, when we design and engineer uh, uh, rockets to go into space or cars or trains, our maps are pretty reliable. This is how we've been able to build everything that we've built or the technology I'm using to talk to you. And in some other fields, our maps are not really good because we still have a lot of uncertainty, lots of things to discover, such as in neuroscience or in psychology. The, our, my field is a relatively recent field and there is still so much more uh, to, 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 to discover. But from this introduction, I wanted to get to two uh, main points that our perception is limited and our attention is part, our attention is limited and our perception is partial is partial, but it's all invisible to us. When the, 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 the public uh, policymakers were the, the communicating on uh, the polio and ice cream cases, they did not know that the information was not really good. They thought that this was the most plausible hypothesis. Basically, we're always constantly filling gaps in our perception. When we have gaps in our reasoning, these gaps are invisible to us. We don't really notice them. Our brain is constantly filling these gaps with many things. And so it becomes interesting when we're talking about crisis communication to take into account the mechanisms with which our brain invisibilizes uh, these gaps. And to do this, I'm going to do a small experiment with you, which is based on uh, an optical illusion. And afterwards, we'll do the jump between our visual perception and our cognition to talk a bit more about what influences these gaps, these uh, feelings that we're constantly using to create a coherent reality. Um, and the the, the uh, illusion is the following. I'm unfortunately not with you in the room, so I'm going to try and imagine that you're doing it. And for, for the first step, I want you to look at this spinning dancer. And some of you are going to be seeing it turning clockwise, and the others are going to be seeing it turning clockwise, which is already a bit weird because you're looking at the same thing and you're not seeing the same thing. Um, so I'm going to try to put everyone uh, on, on the same playing field. If you look now on the right and then in the middle, the dancer in the middle would start turning counterclockwise. This is regardless of what you you saw. Uh, it will happen kind of automatically. You just have to to to, to put your your gaze on the right, and then the middle one will will follow suit. If I do this, if you look now on the left and then in the middle, the dancer in the middle would start to spin clockwise again, regardless of what. Uh, you were seeing, it, it happens automatically, it doesn't really matter, it's not, it's not cognition, it's really perception. And to prove that I'm not cheating or doing anything with the dancer in the middle, if I give you the, 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 the full image, if you look on the right and then in the middle, the dancer in the middle will turn counterclockwise, and if you look left and then in the middle, the, the dancer on the middle will turn clockwise. And the question is why? Why is this happening? And the reason is, We've already talked about it. It's incomplete information. But in this case, it's perceptual information. The dancer in the middle uh, lacks information. The information that is lacking is depth perception. We have uh, 3D movement and no three-dimensional visual cues. Our brain does not know when the leg and the hand are going in the front or in the back. And on the left and on the right, we have added more information, more visual cues. And we have depth perception. So you can see the, the 
left leg with the right with the red line on it going in the back and then in the front and on the uh, on the left you see the blue line that indicates that the right leg is going in the back on the front and this is what gives the movement of orientation and the technical term that we use for for this uh, uh, spinning dancer is an ambiguous stimuli it's ambiguous because it's lacking information and in this case we call this uh, bistable ambiguous stimuli it is bistable because we can stabilize it in two ways we can either add information to stabilize it clockwise or add information to stabilize it clockwise if you notice when you look at the ambiguous stimuli you still see a rotation we don't see it not turning because our brain is filling these gaps. And what happens is very mechanical, it's very simple. If you look for a few seconds on the right and then in the middle, you create what we call a visual prior and your brain is going to stabilize the ambiguity. It's going to add information based on the prior that you just just seen. And if you look on the left, you're going to for another prior and you're going to stabilize the ambiguous stimuli with the other prior. So I look on the left and then in the middle and I carry this prior and see the middle dancer spinning clockwise and I look on the right and I carry another prior and I'm going to see the dancer spinning counterclockwise. So when we're missing information, we're going to fill the gaps with our priors. And if we call this dancer a bistable, so we can stabilize it in two ways, bistable ambiguous uh, information, we call reality in some philosophy of the mind and cognitive science, we call reality a multi-stable ambiguous stimuli. Reality is much more ambiguous than this dancer for the reasons that we've seen in our introduction. And you can stabilize reality in a lot of more numbers than just uh, two times. There are certain philosophers that even say that there are as many ways to stabilize uh, reality as there are humans, and that this is what makes you unique. When we're saying you're unique, we're describing you the unique way with which you stabilize the ambiguity of reality. In psychology, we sometimes consider that the way that you stabilize uh, reality is what we call your uh, personality. For example, let's say I'm, I'm a jealous person. What does it mean to be jealous? Jealous is a certain of description of a certain priors that I have. Let's say I'm jealous, I take my phone, I call the person I'm with uh, in a relationship, and this person does not pick up. The person does not pick up, I don't know why, it's ambiguous. Being jealous means I have a certain set of priors where I'm going to stabilize this ambiguity and tell myself this person is not picking up because they're cheating on me. And it's the same for many, many things. For example, some people are optimistic. What does it mean to be optimistic? Optimistic means I reduce the ambiguity of the future. The future, by definition, is uncertain because it hasn't happened yet. I'm going to stabilize the ambiguity of the future by telling myself that it's going to go well. And if I'm pessimistic, I'm going to tell myself, I'm going to stabilize the ambiguity of the future by telling myself that it's going to be not so well. So basically what we can say is that we don't see the world as it is. Rather, we see the world as we are, which doesn't mean that reality isn't important because it all depends on how ambiguous a situation is. The more a situation is uncertain, the more we can attribute it the meaning we want. For example, uh, I'm giving this talk, I, I can't even see you, this is pre-recorded. I need to reduce the ambiguity of how you're receiving it. I can tell myself that you think that it's not interesting, but then the organizer call me and tell me, oh, everybody loved your uh, presentation or vice versa. Then reality will matter more than my priors. But for a lot of situations, the ambiguity is uncertain and it takes time for it to be certain. When we are faced with uncertain situations, then we most often see things the way we are. And the problem, since we're talking about crisis communication, in crisis situation, most of the time, ambiguity is very high. And since in crisis situation, ambiguity is very high, we need to take into account the priors to see how people are reducing the ambiguity. We can take three situations, three recent situations that, that really illustrate this point, which are the following. For example, COVID. COVID is an extremely new virus. We didn't know about it before we discovered it uh, three years ago now, a bit, two to three years ago. A new virus is extremely uncertain, so everyone is going to reduce the ambiguity of this virus based on their priors. And since it's what we call a socio-scientific topic, it's not just science, it's also sociological because it's touching on uh, the, our daily lives, being in confinement, masks, vaccine, etc. People are going to uh, mix them and we're going to reduce the ambiguity of COVID based on our priors 
so for example, if I have a certain set of priors and political beliefs, I'm going to think that the virus was created by China or because of uh, a certain lab, I'm going to think that the vaccine is either effective or has chips to control us, etc. Same thing with war situations. When we're faced with war situations, obviously it's crisis and obviously it's uncertain. A lot of us don't know much about Ukraine because we weren't really thinking about it before uh, the war uh, started. And when the war starts, we don't really know much, but we have to have an opinion because it's being all around us and we see the destruction and the, the horrors that are coming out. And we, some people, if they have certain priors I don't know about, about Russia are going to have a certain opinion and we've seen narrative being pushed in, in, in such a way. And if I have other priors or I know a bit about the topic, I'm going to have another opinion. And this is possible because it is uncertain and in crisis communication, things are often uh, uncertain. And the final topic, which is one I work on, I work on the uh, human factor uh, uh, in climate change because climate change is not just about technical solution, but it's about all these things that we're talking about. Well, often also in climate change, we see that the priors of people uh, have a high impact because climate change is not just a crisis communication, but it's also what we call a technical topic and you need a certain uh, knowledge to be able to think about it in a non uncertain way to not see it the way you are, but to see it for the way it is, which is a high cost and sometimes not everyone have it so. so, so uh, or rather only a few have it because it's a really complex topic and complexity by definition raises uncertainty. So our brain seems to reduce ambiguity without even us knowing it because it's also a storyteller. Our brain is constantly doing what we call extrapolations and narrations from things. For example, this is a funny uh, image to, to break a bit from the, the, the seriousness of what we were, the examples you were giving. For example, if you see someone like this, obviously it's an absurd image, but our brain is going to do inferences that if there's a mask here, probably there's a mouth. And if there is headphones here, there are ears and the eyeglass here, there are uh, eyes and then uh, this uh, fanny, I don't know what, what it's called, mean that they're uh, um, a boxer, where the fanny is. Uh, our brain is a predictive and approximative organ. Uh, it's not very precise because we need to be efficient, so we need to go fast. And sometimes when we go fast, well, we make mistakes uh, and uh, we can have uh, different reductions of ambiguity, some being uh, more wrong uh, than others. If we summarize everything we've seen till now, we can put it all on a certain like graph that goes like this. When I'm exposed to information, it's a knowledge. The way I link the different bits of information that I'm exposed to is a belief. A belief on which I want to act is an intention. And an intention that I can manifest in the real world is uh, an action. There are many traps that can happen uh, throughout this, this uh, process. I can be exposed to false knowledge, such as fake news, for example. And if I am exposed to false knowledge, my belief, my intention, my action are going to pay the price. But I can also, based on good knowledge, have a false belief, such as the spurious correlation we've seen. The information is true about Nicolas Cage and the drownings, but the belief that Nicolas Cage is causing the drownings is a false one. And obviously, my intention, my action will pay the price. I can have a good knowledge, a good belief, and not have the intention to act on things. For example, I don't want to die. Uh, hypothetically, I don't want to die and uh, I smoke and I know that smoking kills, but I don't have the intention to stop because I can rationalize. I can tell myself we're all going to die one someday. Anyways, things that there's always be something that kills us, etc., etc. And finally, I can have a good knowledge, a good belief. I can have the intention of acting and not being able to act between the intention and the action. We have something called the intention action gap. There's a gap between when I declare the intention of doing something and then when I act on it, for example, a form of intention action gap that you all know is what we call procrastination. For example, I work a lot on the intention action gap facing climate change because we have extremely strong intention from governments, from companies, from citizens, from the European Union, from uh, the United Nations, etc. But then the actions are absolutely not proportionate to the intention that we declare. And we study why is that? Is it because people are lying, we don't think so. Are there other factors? And this could be uh, another topic if anyone is interested. So this graph 
it has a lot of traps that can uh, make it not work perfectly. And they, these traps are impacted by many factors, but one family of factors that can be very important for crisis communication is what we call cognitive biases. And cognitive biases are these sort of shortcuts, these approximation that our brain is doing to be able to be efficient, because we can't take the time to always think about everything, especially in crisis, we need sometimes to go fast. And we've already identified about 200 uh, cognitive biases that are due to many, many things. It can be because there's too much information and we don't know which information is relevant and not. So what do we communicate on? Should we communicate on every single detail or not enough? And then how do we uh, take into account what other people are thinking about the topic we're talking about? What we remember, sometimes if you communicate too much, people won't remember everything. And for example, we want people to remember just one thing. For example, maybe for COVID, we want people to remember masks and opening the windows. And it's fine for the hydroalcoholic gel because we know that the virus is airborne and not surface-based, for example. Sometimes it's because we need to act fast how can we act fast and not be wrong or sometimes because we don't have enough meaning we don't understand really what's going on yet so there's not enough meaning and our storyteller brain is going to create stories that are not really good i don't have a lot of time to go into the details of every bias but i wanted to explain to you where they why where they come from and why they're important so to summarize because i only have two minutes left crisis communication needs to take into account facts of course, it's very important, but also we need to take into account the perceptions of this fact. When we're communicating, the perception is sometimes even more important of, uh, than facts because sometimes facts are not still of very good quality. In the beginning of the pandemic, for example, our facts were not very solid because science sometimes takes time to get good facts. And we need to take into account priors of the people we're communicating with, their culture, their political ideology, the available information, and all these things. Uh, otherwise, our communication uh, becomes very uh, less good quality. Uh, one of the most known biases is called false consensus bias or fundamental attribution bias. And it's based on this sentence that I like a lot. One of the most dangerous ideas one could have is thinking that if everyone uh, was like me, the world will be a better place. We need to take into account that different people have different perceptions of the world and we don't want a uniformity of, uh, of, uh, an, uh, of reductions of ambiguity of reality. We need to realize that not everyone is the same and it's very good, but we need to take into account the different point of views of people because at the end of the day, and I want to finish with this quote by uh, that comes from an episode of Doctor Who, for those, for those who know Doctor Who, that says thinking is just a fancy way of saying changing your mind. Crisis communication involves uh, what we call mental flexibility. We need to be able to change our mind, to adapt to new information that is coming, to new reduction of ambiguity from the public we're communicating to, and always take into account these different uh, uh, point of views. I hope this talk was uh, interesting. I was supposed to have my discussion now, but unfortunately I'm stuck in my room. Uh, but maybe in a future uh, event and have a great uh, Ina uh, uh, day or a couple of days uh, in uh, Marseille. Thank you very much. And I hope uh, it was interesting for you. Thanks, thanks again. And uh, his name is uh, Dr. Albert Mokheiber, for those of you who would uh, like to, to follow him. On, on social media, I'm a big fan of, of this guy, gives a lot of insights into how our brain uh, operates. And thanks again. <laughs>